Our uh, scripture reading for this morning comes from Psalm 90, verses 9 through 12. All our days pass away under your wrath. We finish our years with a moan. The length of our days is 70 years, or 80 if we have strength, yet their span is but trouble and sorrow, for they quickly pass and we fly away. Who knoweth the power of your anger? For your wrath is as great as the fear that is due you. Teach us to number our days aright, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Amen. Would you pause with me for a moment of quiet prayer as we open our hearts and minds to hearing today's meditation. Amen. Well, those words I just read to you from Psalm 90 here a couple of seconds ago don't exactly shout out Happy New Year, do they? It's really not exactly the message I wanted to hear this morning as we begin this time of a brand new year and setting the old one behind us. In fact, they seem to be rather pessimistic, bordering on hopelessness, and yet it's, and so it's not a message that we really feel is probably appropriate for the happiness that we generally associate with the beginning of a new year. The message here seems to be one of our own transience, our, our, tempor our uh, temporary nature here in the world, and our sinfulness. It says the days of our lives are 70 or perhaps 80 years if we are strong. Well, you know, lifespans have increased dramatically in the past 100 years. In 1900, do you know what the average life expectancy was then? 48. If that was the case, there's a good many of us around here that wouldn't be around if that was the, still the, the expected span of life. But that's what it was at the beginning of that last century. By 1950, it was up to 71. And today, our present life expectancy is about 79 years. A biology teacher I know once told me that the theoretical upper limit for human life, the longest human beings could ever live, no matter how much medicine develops over the time to come, would be about 140 years. It has something to do with the number of times a cell can divide or something like that. I didn't understand all that stuff, but he told me 140 was the absolute tops that humanity could ever hope for. But even that is such a brief span of time in light of history and all of eternity. The psalmist recognizes that life is brief and perhaps because of that, to be all the more valued. If you waste money, you can get more money. If you waste time, it's gone forever. It cannot be recouped, it cannot be replaced. It is not the number of years that we live that gives our life value and meaning, but what we do with the time that is allotted to us, be it brief or lengthy, by human standards. Now, that same verse about the brevity of life also speaks about our sinful nature. It's easy to point out the sins of others around us, those of the culture that we're a part of, the lives of other people, but the writer of this psalm recognizes his own moral deficiencies and his own need for forgiveness. Jesus teaches us to take the board out of your own eye so you can see to take the speck out of somebody else's. We always see everybody else's sins to the exclusion of our own. So Jesus says, look at yourself first, make that right, and then you can deal with the concerns of other people. These scriptures don't tell us not to correct others who are wrong, but to get ourselves right first, a step too often overlooked or neglected. A saintly person should be concerned enough about his or her own shortcomings and sins that they don't have time to be pointing out those of everybody else. Now, as you read through this passage of Psalm 90, you see a couple of things. You see a theme of compassion, and also one of indignation over sin. And those things seem to be diametrically opposed to each other, but they really do go together. Compassion, you see, is not an everything is fine attitude. We love our grandkids greatly, but we're not gonna let them get away with things like disobedience and disrespect and laziness or anything else that's gonna drag them down in life. You rightly correct others because you love them. 
You care about them. You want them to be their very best. But your life needs to be in order so that you can do that. That old adage, do as I say, not as I do, just doesn't work because our example really sets before us a lot more than what our words ever say. We need to address our own sins before we start with those of others. God has provided us with the Ten Commandments and the teachings of Jesus to give us order, purpose, and security in our lives. His compassion for us and his indignation over our sinfulness are both components of God's love toward us. We've got to have both of those elements there, the compassion and the concern. That statement in verse 10 speaks of life as characterized by toil and trouble, something which is a part of every year of our lives. Life does have its challenges. Sometimes it's very difficult, very difficult indeed. In our time, we probably don't really appreciate the concept of physical toil as much as they did in earlier times. We have a lot of conveniences today that we really consider to be necessities. Even my 15-year-old car has as much nice stuff on it as my Uncle Dick's 1960 Imperial had on it, which was the gold standard back in that day. Anything he had on that Imperial, I've got on my 15-year-old Chrysler as well. And we come to expect those kinds of things. Power brakes, power steering, automatic transmission, air conditioning, power windows, power seats, moon roof, the whole business, it's all there. And we start to think of these things as being necessities so that even the least expensive vehicle you buy has most of that stuff on it. I don't know about you, but I can't live without a microwave. It makes things so much easier when it comes to food preparation and it saves a lot of time and energy. So things like that become necessities to us after as well too. Remember your grandmother building a fire in the wood stove out in the kitchen? We don't have to do that anymore. You can split wood for heat if you'd like to do that and save some money in the process, or you can just turn the thermostat up or down to adjust the temperature in your house to where you want it. And so we have a lot of things there that were formerly conveniences that we think of as necessities, and they make our life much easier than it used to be. A lot of mechanical things do the work once done by hand and brute force. Even if you work at a job that requires a lot of physical labor, you still have power tools powered by electricity or pneumatics, which speed up that work and make it a whole lot easier than it was back when Abe Lincoln was splitting logs with a big sledgehammer. But there are troubles. We are familiar with that aspect of that verse. The issues of health and family problems and economic concerns and difficulties with people at work. Life is not a smooth ride down the highway, but the blessings of life certainly make it worth the ride. A key question that we might ask as we begin this new year is, how much of the trouble we have in our lives is self-induced? The poor choices that we make, the lack of willpower to do what's right and turn away from what's wrong, the over-dependence we have upon ourselves when others, and God himself can lift us up, but no, we'll do it by ourselves the way that we want to do it. The beginning of a new year is a good time to consider what we might do differently. Today we're going to be observing Holy Communion. It's a central theme in forgiveness and remembrance of Christ's love for us as demonstrated upon the cross of Calvary. It's seeking forgiveness for our sins of the past and looking ahead to doing better in the year that is just beginning. We're also reaffirming our baptism today. The water of baptism symbolizes the washing away of our sins, the cleansing and the spiritual renewal that we experience. This is indeed a day of new beginnings, a time to remember and move on, as our opening hymn suggested. The past is past, to be learned and reformed and built upon in a time that is present and in a time that is to come.